<clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful you brought us together. We are living, Lord, in very serious times of this world's history. We need thee, Lord. We pray that, dear Lord, you may bless us who are gathered here and those whom we are meeting with virtue. We pray in a special way, Lord, that you may be able to impress your spirit upon our hearts. Let your word find an entrance into our lives. May we be transformed, I pray, Lord. I am asking in the name of Jesus Christ that you may awaken us to the reality that we are living in the final days of this world's history. And bind us again together closer to your heart. Revive us. For this is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we are, we are living in a time that if there was ever a greater need for the church, it's the need for revival and reformation of true and primitive godliness. Now we are told that there is a revival that's going to come among its God's people as a revival that prepares the sounding of the loud cry. That revival comes with the reception of the loud rain. That revival is not going to be anything ever seen in this world, in fact, since the apostolic times. Just like the Bible says a trouble comes, a trouble that has never been seen since there was a nation, there is also a revival that is coming. And it's true that we are seeing lukewarmness in God's church. And it is true that we are seeing a lot of things going on among us, God's people, strange things that are showing that the church has gone back to slumber and needs resurrection. I can tell you that God is going to finish this work and he's going to finish it through consecrated vessels. And I'm just praying that I might be, or I may be one of the vessels that God is going to use, purge and use. And so I know that our great need is a revival. We are told in the testimonies, let's pray for the revival. Let's ask for it. Let's plead for it, that God may send a revival among us his people. That is our need. And I think it's something that triggered me to think about the subject, the laudation message, because of the study that we had yesterday evening and something that I've been going through for the better part of the week, which is the message of the 1888. And I remember that through my studies, I've come to realize that in the 1888 messages, in the passing of time, from 1888 through to around 1895. There was also a huge printing of the messages to the Laudation Church. I have come to realize that the Laudation message cannot be separated from the message of 1888. I think it's because of the rejection of the message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that to a greater degree and to a greater extent, the preaching of the laudation message swelled. Why was it so important? Because the laudation message was a message that was sent to the church. It was sent to a church that was full of pride. It was sent to a church that was feeling that their condition was better than they really were. It was sent to a people that felt that they had attained. It was sent to a people that had a need of nothing. There was self-content. And there is nothing as bad as a person who doesn't feel a need of salvation. There is nothing as bad as a person who feels that they have attained when they have not attained. And when I thought of that, I thought about my condition. And I asked God, am I really ready? And I realized I am not ready until I recognize my unworthiness. Until I say, Lord, I am not worthy. I cannot manage it by my own self. I am a man of unbelief. I am a man of filthy lips. You see, this is what Isaiah sees in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees his condition. He could not be able to see the deeper things of heaven without seeing his filthiness. If we don't see the filthiness of our lives, how bad it has been with us. 
how, how, how much we need Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, we are going nowhere. And now, brothers and sisters, um, I want us to understand a little bit about this message. I just want us to take a grasp at what it entirely means. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter number three, from verses number 14, this is the message to Laodicea. And I will be reading the message to Laodicea and sharing with you a little bit of what the spirit of prophecy was saying around those times that I've mentioned in regards to this message. We are told in verses number 14, and to the angels, to the messenger of the church of Laodicea, right? This thing said the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know that thy works. We are talking about a true witness who knows the works of Laodicea, that thou art neither cold nor ox. I would that thou art cold or hot. Laodicea was a city, and in that city was the church to which Christ is speaking. It was a city that was filled with riches. I had time to watch with my son a small video on the history of Laodicea. And it was interesting to notice that there's a time in the history of Laodicea that actually it was attacked and the whole city was brought down. I think it was a earthquake or earth tremor sort of. And the huge pillars went down, the buildings went down. And Rome wrote to Laodicea and Rome was interested in rebuilding or helping to rebuild Laodicea. The Laodiceans uh, prided themselves and replied to Rome that we don't need your help. Laodicea was very rich. It was rich, I guess, with beautiful architectural work. The housing there was beautiful. Laodicea had the automobile, the machinery that were needed to accomplish whatever they needed in their economy. Uh, Laodicea was a great city a great place to be. But unlike the neighboring uh, places or countries or rather regions, Laodicea did not have a water of its own. In fact, they are actually tapped their water from very far and the water which was coming into the Laodicean uh, region was a water that was mixed with a lot of minerals. So somehow it was lukewarm. It was not tasty. When you drank it, you felt like spewing out. And when you study that, you realize that that basic history, you realize that the water was not tasty to most of them, like it was in other regions, where there was beautiful water that flowing on from the mountains and just sweet to drink. And because of the long distance from which they piped the water, the water also was a little bit of lukewarm. So it was lukewarm and nauseatic. And God, Christ says through the angel that I would that you are warm, you are hot or cold. But I wouldn't that you are lukewarm because that's when the water reached the, the city, it was lukewarm. And the Bible continues to say, because thou sayest, I am rich, or rather, verse 16, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased in goods, and have a need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. So Jesus is challenging Laodicea and saying, there is something that you need. What you have is not true riches. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayst be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayst be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes out that thou mayst see. Now, look at the so uh, book Songs of Solomon. Songs of Solomon, if you will, and see if the condition 
described in the Songs of Solomon is not the same condition described there, chapter 5. Songs of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. I'll read from verse 1 for your understanding. I am coming to my garden, and my sister, my spouse, I have gathered my mar with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honeymoon. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink ye, and drink abundantly, O oh beloved. I sleep, but my heart waketh. Why? It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. Saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open for my beloved. My hands dropped with the mine, and my fingers with the sweet smelling mine. Upon the hands of the lock, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was no longer. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Could that be the end of Laodicea? Christ is standing at the door, and Christ is knocking that we may shed off self-righteousness, that we may shed off a feeling that we have attained, a feeling that we are the ones who believe are right, a feeling that we are the ones who have the right doctrines, a feeling of pride that we have all these reform messages and we are the ones who have executed them and done them. Christ is coming and knocking that we might accept his righteousness. And what's the response? I have slept. I have put off my coat. I have taken off my shoes. It's late in the night. And we might wake up to the reality that when we come to the door, the beloved might not be there. Christ might not be knocking anymore. I think that's why the Laodicean state is the state of the foolish virgins because the foolish virgins, when Jesus Christ comes in, they are out. This was the same state where the Jews found themselves about. I, I am preparing and doing a larger series of this. But to get this uh, uh, shorter, shorter version of it. The Jews were found in the Laodicean state when Jesus Christ came the first time. They were too proud to receive Jesus Christ as a redeemer. In fact, the wise men and the shepherds, men who are despised in the society, received Jesus gladly, but not the Jews. Greater miracles were done. Greater faith was experienced among the Gentiles, the Syrophoenician woman. Talk about the centurion, but such a faith was lacking among us, the people of God. Brothers and sisters, could God's people be living in the same time where we are also rejecting Jesus Christ standing at the door and knocking at the door of our churches, our conference, our various homes? Have we been ruined by this same experience of Laodicea? So that we might be thinking that we are speaking of a people when we ourselves are in the same state of Laodicea where we are priding ourselves of the attainments that we have. Think about the rich young ruler. As he approached Jesus Christ and prided himself of his attainments, as Jesus mentioned the commandments and he self-marked his achievements and said to the end of it, all these have I done. There is no more thing that I need. I have attained heaven. If this is all that it means to attain heaven, I have it. I have kept all those commandments, not from the time I got my, from my youth. We could also be priding ourselves as we look to the moments that we received certain facets of truth. I have homeschooled and I have gone to the country and I know about the true God and I know about the sanctuary, I know the national Sunday law. 
I know what the Pope is doing. That's okay. But Jesus says to him, go sell everything that you have. Because selfishness was wrought in him and he couldn't give up self. Jesus Christ came to this world to teach us what it means to live a selfless life. The Bible says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly spirit. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Jesus Christ, which mind he humbled himself, even to the death of the cross. The Laodicean message comes to the people of God when they're in a sad state, deceived, and it comes as a sharp denunciation. Look at the screen now as we check through uh, what's going on through the time that this message is being shared with them. This is what we are told. The laudation message. Listen to the messages that comes to God's feet. In the parable which Christ, in the parables which Christ had spoken, it was his purpose both to warn the rulers and to instruct them who are willing to be taught. But there was need to speak yet more plainly. Through their reverence for tradition and their blind faith in a corrupt priesthood, the people were enslaved. This chains Christ must break. The character of the priests, the rulers, and the Pharisees must be made fully exposed. When Jesus Christ came, there was a time that he had to speak stern rebuke to the Laudation people. The message to Laodicea is a stern rebuke. Ellen White says it will bring a shaking amongst God's people. It is a testimony from the true witness. It is a message that plainly states the condition. It's like a doctor who now zeroes in to the main problem that the patient is dealing with. It's not just a kidney problem, it's a failure of this particular minute organ or I mean minute section of the kidney. It's the nephrons, it's, 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 it's whatever it is, it's the zeroing in. Jesus zero says, your problem is you are seeing yourself better than you really are. And as long as you keep seeing yourself that you're better than you really are, thinking you're rich and increased with good and have a need of nothing, you can never be saved. But if you have to be saved, you must say, Lord, I believe, save my unbelief. Help my unbelief. You remember in Mark chapter 9, where that man says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He says, yes, I believe you are the son of God. I believe, but that's not enough. I believe that you, there is only one true God. That's not enough. I have a little bit of belief, but save my unbelief. You know, we can have belief, but still have unbelief. We can believe by seeing, but we can still have unbelief in the plain writings of God's word. Christ came to make everything plain. He set the condition of the Jews straight. He told them, you are the people who killed the prophets. In fact, Zacharias, the son of Barakias, you killed him right at the porch, between the porch and the altar, while they were praying. You have done so much that Jesus Christ thought that he would not let his life end in this world without plainly speaking to the Jews. And he finally exposed their deception. We are told he spoke more plainly, continuing to read. At the time of the passing of the events in 1888, there was a rejection of the testimonies. People were denying the writings of Ellen White. And it was written, man may get up scheme of the scheme, and the enemy will seek to seduce souls from the truth. But all who believe that the Lord has spoken through Sister White and has given our message will be saved from the many delusions that will come in this last days. One of the mistakes we can do is to begin thinking in these last days that God has not spoken to his church through the prophet to the remnant church. 
one of the great mistakes we can do is to think that the testimonies are of none effect in these last days. We are told in We are told, I have waited anxiously, hoping that God would put his spirit upon some and use them as instruments of righteousness to awaken and to set in order his church. I have almost despaired, as I have seen, year after year, a great departure from the simplicity which God has shown me should characterize the life of his followers. There has been less and less interest and devotion to the cause of God, I ask. Wherein have those who profess the confidence in testimony sought to live according to the light given in them? Wherein have they regarded the warnings given? Wherein have they heeded the instructions that they have received? when there is no special effort made to resist the devil's power, when indifference prevails in the church and in the world, Satan is not concerned. For he is in no longer in no danger of losing those whom he is leading captive to his will. But when the attention is called to eternal things and souls are inquiring, what must I do to be saved, he is on the ground seeking to match his power against the power of Christ and to counteract the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are told, as I continue to read, neglect of the solemn responsibilities. His blessings have been withdrawn. Uh, his blessings have been withdrawn because the, because the testimonies he has given have not been heeded by those who profess to believe in them. And so God has given us testimonies. And if we do not believe, if we do not live according to the testimonies that we have been given, then God's frown will be upon us. All for a religious awakening. The angels of God are going from church to church, doing their duty. Church to church, as we can see in the book of Revelation. Angels of God are going from church to church. What are they doing? The angel of God are doing their duty. And Christ is knocking at the door of your hearts for entrance. But the means that God has devised to awaken the church to a sense of their spiritual destitution have not been regarded. The voice of the true witness has been heard in reproof, but has not been obeyed. Men have chosen to follow their own way instead of God's way because self was not crucified in them. The Bible says, I am crucified with, with, with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it is not me that live, it is Christ that liveth in me. Thus the light has but little effect upon the minds and the hearts of people. We are told as we continue reading, the message to the church of Laodiceans is a startling denunciation and it's applicable to the people of God at the present. When you're talking about the message to Laodicea, we are talking about a message which we are told is a startling denunciation. This is a startling denunciation to the people of God. Reading we are told, um, we are told in Testimonies Volume 3, 352, the Lord he assures us that the message to be born to his people by ministers whom he has called to warn the people is not a peace and safety message. It is not merely theoretical, but practical in every particular. The people of God are represented in the message to the Laodiceans as in a position of carnal security. There's nothing as sad as being in a position of carnal security. When you feel secure, and yet you have no security, you are exposed to every danger. They are at ease, believing themselves to be an exalted, 
condition of spiritual attainment. Like the young rich ruler, they say we have attained it. We have received it. We have reached where we ought to reach. We are told, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have a need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I will spew thee out. That's the message that God has for Laodicea. I will spew thee out. I will spew thee out is the message that God has for Laodicea. We are told as we continue reading, what great deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are all wrong? I, 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 I want to read that out for you again. Because we need to understand what is going on, brothers and sisters. What greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are all wrong? What is so bad when Zadok feels that his spiritual condition is better than he really is? When he feels he has attained when he has not attained? When he feels he has reached the climax when he's all worthless stone in God's mining industry? The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception. I don't know whether you've seen this, brothers and sisters. The message of, true, uh, of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception. Could we be in a sad deception when this message comes to us? The message to Laodicea is the message to the people of God in a sad deception. Yet honest in that deception, they honestly think they are. They honestly think we are the remnant. They honestly think, hey, they, I mean, God has no other option. We are the people. And it doesn't matter what we do. We can mess ourselves. We can do what we want. We are the people. The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. They know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. While those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in an exalted spiritual condition, the message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. The testimony so cutting and severe cannot be a mistake, for it is the true witness who speaks, and, the, and his testimony must be correct. Continuing, brothers and sisters, we are told God leads his people step by step. The Christian life is a constant battle and a march. There is no rest from the warfare. It is by constant unceasing effort that we maintain victory over the temptation of Satan. We are told as the people or as a people, we are uh, as a people, we are uh, 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 triumphing in the clearness and strength of the truth. We are fully sustained in our position by an overwhelming amount of plain scriptural testimony. But listen now, we are told, uh, I think this, uh, We are told that, but we are very much wanting in Bible humility, in patience, in faith, in love, in self-denial, in watchfulness, and the spirit of sacrifice. We need to cultivate Bible holiness. We need to cultivate Bible holiness. This is what God is telling us, brothers and sisters. This is our state as a people. We need to cultivate now as never before, Bible holiness. Continuing to read down there, it, we are told in Testament volume, volume 3, 253, paragraph number 2, the plain message of Ruby to the Laudation is not received. So the question should be asked, have we today received this plain testimony? We are told it's not yet received. Many cling to their doubts and their darling sins 
when they are in are so great a deception as to talk and feel that they are in need of nothing. They think the testimony of the Spirit of God in reproof is uncalled for, or that it does not mean them. Such are in the greatest need of the grace of God and spiritual discernment that they may discover their deficiency. Oh, there is a deficiency. Oh, there is malnutrition. Oh, there is a problem with God's people in spiritual knowledge. They lack almost every qualification necessary to perfect Christian character. They have not a practical knowledge of Bible truth, which leads to loneliness of life and a conformity of their will to the will of Christ. They are not living in obedience to all of God's requirements. You need to read there, my friends. God's people are in a slumber mode. In my last vision, I was shown that even this decided message, just know that half for you to see. I was shown that even in this message happening, it says, I was shown. My last vision that even this decided message of the true witness had not accomplished the design of God. The people of God were in a slumber. Which slumber? Slumber on in their sins. They continued to declare themselves rich and having a need of nothing. Many inquire, why are all these reproofs given? Why do you keep calling for revival and reformation? Why do you keep calling for victory over sin? Why are all these rebukes and presentations that are calling people to perfect holiness in Christ? Why do the testimonies continually charge us with backsliding and with grievous sin? And this time, Ellen White was writing time after time to the church. I wish we'll find time to go through that history. Time after time, letters were going to the churches, rebuking the darling sins in the churches. And they were asking, why do the testimonies continually charge us with backsliding and grievous sin? We are okay. We are doing well. Why are you continually sending letters after letters? Now, continue to read. We love the truth. They were telling Sister White, we love the truth. We love the truth. We are prospering. We are doing well. We are in no need of these testimonies of warnings and reproof. But let these murmurers see their hearts and compare their lives to the practical teachings of the Bible. Let them humble their souls before God. Let the grace of God illuminate the darkness and the scales will fall off from their eyes and they will realize their true spiritual poverty and wretchedness. Oh, brethren, that I might humble myself. Oh, that I might see myself in the true condition that God sees me. Oh, that I may take off the, 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 the cataracts that have blinded my eyes, measuring myself by myself, or measuring myself by other standards, but rather to measure myself by the standards of God, to apply the divine lens of heaven to see my true condition, to take myself to the mirror of heaven that I may see the dark on myself, rather than looking at myself in the mirror of what man says I am. The spirit of prophecy says that this murmur sees their hearts and compare their lives. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, if if this murmur would let their hearts compare their, I mean, uh, uh, would this murmur see their hearts and compare their lives with the practical teachings of the Bible? If they would humble their souls before God and let the grace of God illuminate the darkness then the scales will fall off. Does it mean we have scales? Yes. We're having what is called spiritual cataracts. If you've ever seen or in your family members have suffered cataracts, you know how cloudy and scaly their eyes are and they don't see things clearly as they really are. This is what is happening in God's church. This is what's happening in our families. We don't see ourselves as we really are. We walk out and the neighbor says, is this a Christian who asks me to come for Sabbath to worship? We walk in the streets and the people say, is this the end? The, the transactions in our business, the corruption in our offices, 
The things that we do for gain of earthly exaltation, the pride that we have that we have attained when our character is full of wretchedness. They will feel the necessity of buying gold, which is pure faith and love. White raiment is the spotless character made pure in the blood of the dear Redeemer. And I shall, which is the grace of God, which will give them clear discernment of spiritual things. Is there need of a clear discernment of spiritual things? Yes, it is a gift that every one of us needs to pray for. What is called clear discernment of spiritual things and detect sin. Do you have clear discernment of spiritual things and detect sin? These attainments are most precious than the gold of Ophelia. Continuing to read, brothers and sisters, we are told in the rise of the third angel's message, those who engage in the work of God add something to venture. They add sacrifices to make. They started this work in poverty and suffered the greatest deprivations and reproach. They met determined, they met determined opposition which drove them to God in their necessity and kept their faith alive. Our present plan of systematic benevolence amply sustains our ministers, and there is no want and no call for the exercise of faith as to our support. Now, those who start out now to preach the truth have nothing to venture. They have no risks to run, no special sacrifices to make. The system of truth is made ready to their hand. The publications are provided for them, vindicating the truths they advance. Why am I putting this question? They, have a, they don't have a need of anything. And so we are having a system that has grown where the people of God look at them and say, look at our universities, what are you talking about? We are better off than the time of the pioneers. Look at how full our libraries are. We don't anymore have the books of a standard three or a grade three student. You can see, I mean, we have books by professors. You can see the people who educate in our college. You can see our health institutions. They are no longer places where we are using herbs or all these concussions are picked from the field. We are using sophisticated medicines. What do you mean that we are poor? The ministers come in, they are fluent. They can capture the whole congregation. Thousands of people pack the cathedrals. Praise God for COVID that can close them down. And people think, what do you mean? Joseph Bates could only gather a handful. We can gather millions of people, uh, perhaps in Uhuru Park, or in this park, or in that park. And people feel like, and we can talk about them, but what about us? What about ourselves? What about myself? Don't we feel that we are in the same condition, priding ourselves of the attainments that we have made? We have a need of nothing. We have nothing to sacrifice. And if Christ was to live today, he would not be in our colleges, he would not be in our churches, he would be nowhere because he's not qualified enough. There's no one who has a need of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. The same way the Jews did not have a need of Jesus Christ, they didn't need him in their theology schools, they, need him, they, they, they didn't need him as one of their ministers, they didn't need him as a source of salvation, they were content in the sacrificial system, they are content with the tithes and offerings they were given, they are content with the priesthood system of sacrifices, they had a need of nothing, that's the same way we have a need of nothing today. We are content with tithes and offerings. We are content with our ceremonies of weeks of prayers and camp meetings. We are content with our ministry. We are content with the, the, the doctrines. We believe this is the Sabbath day. We believe this. This, this is the I mean this is the true God. We believe that people should be going to the country. We believe that we should go to school. We are content with that information. We have a need of nothing. We don't spend time to pray. We don't mourn our spiritual declination. You don't look at how often you used to pray and spend time with God, how you fasted, how you sought God in tears 
you no longer do it. You can't mourn your spiritual condition. You can only mourn for other people while you are in a worse state. That's what was happening in the rich young woman. The new dream of brothers and sisters. The Laodicean message applies to the people of God who profess to believe the present truth. The greater part are lukewarm professors, having a name but no zeal. They profess to love the truth. Wanajifanya, wanapenda ukweli yet are deficient in Christian favor and devotion. I want you to ask yourself, are you having this deficiency? Crops that lack magnesium will be yellowish. They show by their leaves that something is wrong. And probably, it could be true that we are already showing a deficiency. In our family setup, at our workplace, in our interaction in various businesses of the day, we are already wanting in spiritual attainment. They dare not give up wholly and run the risk of the unbeliever. But as Samuel said in this day, they are worse than infidels. They dare not give up wholly and run the risk of the unbeliever. Yet they are unwilling to die to self and follow out closely the principles of their faith. This is foundation. This is why this message is coming to them. Continue to me. What's the only hope of foundation? What is our only hope? Listen carefully. The only hope for the foundation is a clear view of their standing before God a clear understanding of who they are, a knowledge of the nature of their disease. When the great medical missionary comes and does a diagnosis and you say, no, 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 I don't accept that that is my condition, it's very difficult for the doctor to proceed with treatments. And the problem with Laodicea is when we don't want to accept our true condition, we don't want to accept our deep knowledge of the nature of the disease that we are suffering. They are neither cold nor hot. They occupy a neutral position and at the same time flatter themselves that they are in need of nothing. The true witness hates this lukewarmness. He loathes their indifference of this uh, class of person. Say the, I would thou what cold or hot. Like lukewarm water, they are nauseous to his taste. They are neither unconcerned nor selfishly stubborn. They do not engage thoroughly and heartily in the work of God, identifying themselves with its interest. But they hold aloof and are ready to leave their posts when their worldly personal interests demand it. The internal work of grace is wanting in their heart. Of such it is saying, listen carefully, friends. Thou sayest I'm rich and increase with goods. You have a need of nothing. And know it's not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That is our only hope. Our only hope, brothers and sisters, is a clear view of our standing before God and knowledge of the nature of our disease. This is the diagnosis of the great medical missionary of our condition. Shall we accept the diagnosis or shall we reject the diagnosis? I will show that many are flattering themselves that they are good Christians who have not a ray of light from Jesus. They have not a living experience for themselves in the divine life. They need a deep and thorough work of self-abasement before God. They will feel, they will feel their true need of honesty. They need a deep and a thorough work of self-abasement before God before they will feel their true need of honest, persevering effort to secure the precious graces of this perfect. Continuing to read by sisters. Brethren, in the name of our Lord, I call upon you to awake to your duty. 
Let your hearts be yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. And they will be made susceptible to the teachings of the world. Then you'll be able to discern the deep things of God. May God bring his people under deep movings of his spirit. May he lead them to arouse and see their peril and to prepare for what is coming upon the earth. We are told to those who are indifferent at this time, Christ's warning is, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The figure of spewing out of his mouth means that he cannot offer up your prayers or your expression of love to God. Ah, this is so deep, brothers and sisters, that when you are laudation, your prayers will not be offered up to God. Magoti utapiga. This is very sad. And this is very huge. That we can spend days on Sabbath, we can spend hours of the night praying, but our prayers shall never be taken by the mediator, the only mediator between man and God, man Jesus Christ to the Father. He cannot endorse your teaching of his word or your spiritual work in any wise. When you are laudation, you can preach, you can do crusades, you can cross the world, you can build institutions, you can go to the country, you can do homeschooling, but he says God will not endorse your work. Listen carefully. He cannot endorse your teachings of his word or your spiritual work in any wise. He cannot present your religious exercises with the request that grace be given you. Brothers and sisters, Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Are you telling me this group is laudation? This is a laudation group, brothers and sisters. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 20. Uh, read from, this is very serious, brothers and sisters. Matthew chapter 7, sorry, I was in chapter 6. From verses number 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? These are prophecy students. We have been teaching prophecy. We have been exposing wrong. We have been showing where the Pope is. We have been showing the false Sabbath. We have been showing the beast of Daniel and Revelation. We have prophesied in thy name. And in thy name, we have cast out devils. Those are medical missionaries. We have cast them because the work of medical missionaries should be casting out demons, demons of disease, demons of whatever, intemperance. Hey, we have cast out demons in thy name. And in thy name, done many wonderful works. We have done many good things in your name. Verse 23, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's Laodicea. Could the curtain be rolled back? Could you discern the purpose of God and the judgments that are about to fall upon the doomed one? Could you see your own attitude? You would fear and tremble for your own souls and for the soul of your fellow men. Honest prayers of heart-rending anguish would go up to heaven. You would weep between the porch and the altar, confessing your spiritual blindness and backslide. The destiny of the church. The message to the Laodiceans has not accomplished the zealous repentance among God's people, which I expect to see. My perplexity of mind has been great. Ellen White was really the star. What was the destiny of this church? 
testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed. The destiny of the church hangs where? On the message of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 17, being heeded. The church seen their true spiritual condition. I want myself in my family to see our true spiritual condition. That we are not fit, that we are dressed in our own dress, which is filthy rags. I desire that we see that we have not highly lived the Bible esteemed lifestyle rather than pride myself that I have attained. I pray that I see my true spiritual condition, my defects of character, that I see that I am worse than I would think I am really. I, I, I really is. This testimony must work deep repentance, and all that truly receive it will obey it and be purified. Only those who receive this testimony will be purified. We are told, and listen to this carefully. I think I just lost uh, part of it. So I just want to uh, bring it down there. We are told, listen carefully. I was shown that the testimony in the laudation applies to God's people in this present time. And the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their heart. The hardness of their heart. But God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. Unadambi ambazos in the Fungia Christo angel. This fearful message will do its work. When it was first presented, it led to a close examination of the heart. At first presentation, it led to a close examination of the heart. We are told as we continue reading, sins were confessed and the people of God were stirred everywhere. Nearly all believed that this message would end in the loud cry of the third angel's message. Now, brothers, we need to pause and think a little. The message of laudation would lead to the loud cry of the third angel's message. This is a very important message then, when he did. Continuing to read. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effect of the message. So rather than seeing this message as a blessing to them, they saw this message as a stern rebuke, which was without a cause. It was not necessary. And by doing that, they did not experience the beginning of the fall of the latter rain. Remember, it's the early rain that we must receive first or work receiving the early rain before we can receive the latter rain. And so it's only true and it's clear to us who are listening today that if the that angel's message does not have an effect in our life, then it only means we have refused to heed the message to Laodicea. Because the Laodicean message came with a rebuke. It came showing us our true condition. But instead of being thankful for the mirror, he went ahead to fight the mirror and we broke the mirror. We rejected that which was showing us our true condition. Instead of the Jews accepting Jesus Christ, our righteousness, they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross and they were left without a Savior. 
Instead of Israel being thankful for Moses, they turned against Moses. And what happened is that by a prophet, you are brought out of Egypt, and by a prophet, you are preserved. And without the testimonies of the prophet, which they rejected, they were led into apostasy, they worshipped evil gods, and they went into captivity. They rejected the testimonies of the true witness. Are we seeing our true condition? That should be our question. Are we seeing our true condition? Reading down. Reading down here. <clears throat> Listen to this carefully. I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months. Why? Because of the hardness of their heart. They needed. In fact, go with me to Ezekiel chapter 33. You can see. Ezekiel chapter 36, not 33. 36. Ezekiel 36. This is interesting, friends. Ezekiel 36, verse 20, 25. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean for all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. The Bible says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgment and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I have given to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn, and will give increase, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. This is what will bring the loud cry of the third angel's message. A true seeing of ourselves. Only those who see that they truly are sick will need a physician. Those who do not feel the seriousness of their, I mean, if someone told you, hey, you have cancer, you run to the doctors, you begin looking for help as early as possible. But if you don't feel that you are sick, you will not need a physician. We as a people have not seen our spiritual condition as we have to see. That's why we don't need Jesus. But he says that if this experience is received, that will lead to the sounding of the loud cry, then we are told that actually God will call for the corn and will increase it, verse 29, and lay no farmer in upon you. There will be no farmer in upon us. There will be increase. There will be filling with the word of God. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree. We will not be barren trees anymore. We will not be fig trees that Jesus Christ would only pass by and see, and, hey, its leaves were flourishing, but we are told it had no fruit, and the vine must have seen, laid the axe at the root, cut it down. It, it's like the Jews nation. It was flourishing. People looked at it and thought like it was the chosen nation, but it was the one plotting to kill Jesus Christ. It was a fig tree with beautiful leaves, but no fruit. Cut it down for why cumbereth it the ground, my brothers and sisters. And what happens here is the experience we receive when we see our true condition and repent is not like that. We are told we'll multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that they shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Why is there famine among the heathen? Why can't the world be brought to Christ? Why are people not being warned to Christ? Why are we struggling with crusades? It's because our lives are not what they ought to be. We see ourselves that we are better than we really are. We are messed up in our relationships. We are messed up in our families. We are messed up in our churches. We are so tainted with corruption and immorality that the world feels they are better off outside than being inside. I was walking and doing a ministry in one place and one woman told me, she said, you would want to come, you're preaching the truth, but as long as that man you're calling your elder is still in that church, we cannot be there because it's not a Christian. What you're teaching is truth. You have the truth. Someone may say, hey, 
Brother Zadok, you know, we're not coming to the church looking at people. We're coming looking at Jesus Christ, but realize the 144,000 will be just like Jesus Christ. And we are told that there are thousands, there are so many whom God will not work to bring to the church today because of the spiritual condition of the people in the church. You are too much in your village. How can church people of your village be converted to, your truth, to the truth? How on earth can they? We are told by our sisters, this message is designed to arouse the people of God to discover their backsliding and to lead to a zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel's message, hallelujah, amen. The laudation message is to fit the people for the loud cry of the third angel's message. We are told, as this message affected the earth, it led to deep humility before God, humble as God. And then we are told, angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. We have hindered unbelieving hearts by, 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 by rejecting the laudation message. If we received this message, brothers and sisters, as a love message, then angels would be sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. But how can angels go preparing hearts to be one into a church that is corrupt and defiled? Angels cannot do that work. They cannot work in such sort of confusion. They cannot do that work. How can they work and cooperate with those who cannot think angels are sinless beings? They don't know how to work or fall into ecumenism with men and women who are proud and covetous and loving the world. For the love of the world is enmity. Says, the cause of God began to rise and his people were acquainted with their position. If the counsel of the two witnesses had been fully eaten, God would have wrought for his people in a greater power. <clears throat> Yet the efforts made since the message has been given have been blessed of God. And we are told, and many souls have been brought from error and darkness to rejoice in the truth, all for a revival. All for a revival of the true laudation message. This message is what is going to bring the shaking brothers and sisters. Ellen White says uh, that before she dies, something would, uh, would, would, would happen. But brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, God will not keep the loud cry through backsliders, ambitious, covetous, one loving, self-sufficient people. God will not give the loud cry through the backsliders, through ambitious through covetous, through world loving and self con uh, self confident self efficient people a people who see brothers and sisters it is my prayer that now as never before you will in your heart accept Jesus Christ and be converted uh, uh, by him uh, uh, I want this to be seen. Um, if any will not be purified through obeying the truth and overcome their selfishness, their pride and evil passions, the angels of God have charge. They are joined to their idols. Let them alone. And they pass on to their work, leaving these with their sinful traits and subdued to control their to the control of evil angels. You see what's happening. Those who come up to every point, those who come up to every point, and stand every test, and overcome, be the prize what it may. 
si sheria ya Mungu ya sabato lazima tutembee kwenye ujumbe huo hata ikiwa ni kifo so that's what we have been told those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome be the price what it may have heeded the counsel of the true witness and they will receive the latter rain hallelujah and thus be fitted for translation those who reject the laudation message will never see that rain god leads his people step by step he brings them up to different points calculated to manifest what is in their heart some endure at one point but fall in the next at every advance point at every advance point the heart is tested and tried a little closer if the professed people of god find their heart to post this straight work it should convince them that they have a work to do to overcome if they would not be spewed out of the lord's mouth continuing to read say the angel god will bring a work closer and closer to test and prove every one of his people some are willing to receive one point but when brings when god brings them to another testing point they shrink from it and stand aside because they find that it strikes directly at some cherished idol we are told here they have opportunity to see what is in their hearts that shuts out jesus they prize something higher than the truth and their hearts are not prepared to receive jesus individuals are tested and proved a length of time to see if they will sacrifice their idol and heed the counsel of the true witness come up to every point stand every test overcome be the price what it may brothers sisters what will bring a shaking what is it that will bring a shaking that's the question i have with what is it that will bring a shaking i want to read for you a quote here from the last thing that i read before we stop over what is it that will bring a shaking so what do you want to look at what is it that will bring a shaking i'm just going to open uh, uh my uh estate for a minute what is it that will bring this shaking that we are talking about there's a shaking that is coming but what will bring this shaking there's a great talk about shaking and what is it that will bring this shaking i want to read i want to read from a beautiful book and this book is the book last day events last day events what will bring this shaking commonly talked about by god's people i, I i've talked about this before but let me just uh, blow it up for us to be able to see it oh let me up zoom True witness today. Yeah. Now I want you to see this bar and sisters on what I have on the screen here. And this is what is going to bring the shaking. Yes. I say, I asked, I don't know if I'm here, I asked the meaning of the shaking. I had seen, I was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the laudation. Now listen to this. This straight testimony will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver. The first thing that the testimony of the true witness to laudation will have is effect upon the heart of the receiver. Wewe unapokea huu ujumbe to the laudation charge it must have effect upon your life then it will lead you to exalt the standard call everyone to the standard of righteousness that is needed and then you will pour forth the straight truth which is now what is called the loud cry 
of the third angel's message. Some will not bear this straight testimony. So when it comes, the people will not bear it. They will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking among God's people. And then we are told, there are those among us who will make confession as did Achan, but too late to save themselves. They are not in harmony with right. They despite the true testimony that reaches the earth and would rejoice to see everyone silenced with who gives the reproof. The Lord calls a renewal of a straight testimony born in the years past. He calls for a renewal of spiritual life. The spiritual energies of his people have long been torpedoed, but there is to be a resurrection from apparent death. By prayer and confession of sin, we must clear the king's highway. Amen. And amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to say that this is what the Lord wants in us. A revival of the message to Laodiceans. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to see who we are. Help us to review our life. That we may think about our true condition. If we find ourselves wretched, may we fall before your son to this point. May you help us to understand what he's doing for us in the most holy place. And understand that the day of atonement is about to happen, you know, and that we must now be purified from all people. May our blessings be upon all who now, Lord, are listening, who now all are heeding to this message, that our people may be found to sound the loud cry. So I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.